Hi, my name is Ben B.T. Hood, and welcome to this complete introduction to advanced TypeScript. This talk will be in an unusual format. We're going to move quickly and deeper into some advanced TypeScript topics, so I've made this entire presentation into a book format. I'll share this slide deck as an ebook, and you'll be able to search it if there's something you want to look up. Everything I will say will be on the left, more or less. And as we're going to do it like this, it will include heaps of links into deep dives on each concept for you to review further if you're interested. But mostly just for now, you can just concentrate on the right hand side of this talk, which will be the code, overview and diagrams. The combination of having all the notes already taken for you, as well as links and the code available like this as an ebook, will mean that we can go faster without you feeling like you have to remember every detail because you can search for it in the ebook text. And so I want you now to just sit back, relax. We will be covering some advanced TypeScript content, but first we need to start way back at the beginning, and the first step is Babel. JavaScript is an implementation of the ECMA script standard. ECMA script v1, ES1, was released in 1997, and then came ES2 in 98, ES3 in 99, and so on. Each current version was known as ES Next and supported by the current browsers. Each version added syntactic sugar, but we need sites like caniuse.com to know which browsers supported which version syntax. Babel was originally a project called 6 to 5, released in 2015, and it let devs write ESNext syntax and then output earlier versions. This process is called down-leveling. Meanwhile, Node.js was launched in 2009 and NPM in 2010, and an ecosystem for front-end and back-end exponentially grew, now currently two times larger than all the other package ecosystems put together. But over 60% of the packages on NPM have a dependency chain of greater than 4, and over 61% are found to be potentially abandoned in a recent study. So you can see that ecosystem velocity can be a concern. Is your documentation in date, compatibility matrices for dependency chains, and etc. And now add increasing security concerns too. So how do we protect our projects against runtime errors when we update these packages in this constantly evolving ecosystem? Two tools for this are tests and documentation. We can protect against churn from ecosystem velocity by adding exhaustive testing, and we can mitigate difficulty learning new versions of packages by supplying documentation with them. However, tests are a double-edged sword. They can help certainty and thereby speed development, but exhaustive testing can also slow development by adding friction where tests need to be updated. Writing documentation takes time and can quickly become out of date. So can we use these two tools perhaps in a different way by combining them? I'm a great believer that the solution to every problem is included inside it, like the seed in an apple. I'd like to introduce you to the idea of static testing now. This is a testing pyramid. Normally pyramids indicate how one type is built upon another, but this is different. The vertical axis here indicates coverage per complexity and the horizontal axis indicates coverage per effort. The aim here is to make your tests as wide as possible and as low on this chart as possible. And this is where static tests are pitched. Static testing is the practice of evaluating code before even running it, giving you the fastest feedback. Types perform compatibility checking within your code and between packages, and so provide the simplest form of static testing. Types may also work as documentation, since they're guaranteed to be up to date. JavaScript is structurally typed at runtime. TypeScript acts as a layer on top of JavaScript that allows you to define these structural types as contracts. Running TypeScript then checks these contracts for you, and thereby you know if updated packages are still compatible, and also that your inline documentation is always up to date. In TypeScript, you define these structural contracts as interfaces. These interfaces can be given names when you define them. Here is a named interface called person. These interfaces are a terse way to specify to the static testing system that the values must exist and be of the correct format. This allows us to delete lots of boilerplate code, such as parameter or return type checking, thereby reducing noise and helping maintainability of JavaScript code. Interfaces in TypeScript can also be anonymous with no name. Here, an interface is defined in line as the argument of a method and is unnamed an anonymous interface. This means you can assign anonymous interfaces as well as other existing types to type aliases. Type aliases allow you to do more powerful things with types, which we'll cover a bit later. You can also assign existing types, such as primitives, to type aliases. 
And because in JavaScript fields are resolved at runtime, a value passed in only has to fulfill at least the contract specified. That is to say, if you pass in more fields, the function will still work, ignoring those, aka duck typing. However, TypeScript has smart. If you define the value either as args inline or specify the type alongside the value, it will alert you to extra fields that might actually be typos. This is an aspect of type narrowing, and links are included for more information. Types can also take parameters. They can take generic parameters, which you can then reference to constrain aspects of a type, and types can also be delegates, which means that a type takes inputs before it provides a value. And they can be a composite of the both, as in the case of this onclick handler, a delegate which is also generic type. TypeScript supports classes too, adding some helpful tooling around inline fields, property getters and setters, access modifiers, and inheritance. But use these features with caution because JavaScript gains much of its flexibility from its functional nature, so we'll leave classes for now and continue back with the power of types. As TypeScript is based on ESNext syntax, as well as classes, it supports all the other ESNext constructs and adds static testing for all of them. Promise async await, supported in TypeScript in 2015, while its official ES6 adoption was only still beginning. So based on ESNext, TypeScript ships with built-in down-leveling support when targeting older ES versions. However, this is what Babel slash Rome has already been getting better and better at. And so more recently, the TypeScript team have reoriented to contribute instead via Babel plugins with TypeScript instead run out of process as a static test system, which increases build speed. To each of these ESNext features, TypeScript brings static testing. Spread or rest is another example. You can spread values from objects, rest values from objects, and spread and rest from arrays, and TypeScript can infer and check the value of the result. But let's rewind this and think about it for a second. Can we define the type of foobar? Because JavaScript types are structural, they can be spread into each other as we've seen. So this means that the same concepts can also be applied to types. We can assign a combined type to an alias like this, intersecting it together, and then use it. This combined type is called an intersection type, you can concatenate anonymous types in intersections too, like this. And because of structural typing, these types continue to work as the same minimum contract that we saw before. So if you think of types as a contract that define minimum requirements of a value, what values could be assigned to A in this case? Pretty much any string, right? But what if we wanted to hold various values, strings, booleans, numbers? How could we do that in a static testing system? TypeScript provides an any type just for this. But the problem is that this removes all the type protection from the variable. So the any type effectively disables TypeScript for a given variable, and we lose that fast feedback cycle of static testing. So instead, now TypeScript offers a preferred variant called unknown to correctly identify syntax errors. This type means I don't know what this is yet, but I will know by the time I run a method on it. And then if we reach a point where we know what is in unknown, we can explicitly cast it to tell the compiler we know what we're doing here. TypeScript will always check a cast to ensure it is either from an any or unknown, or from a type that fulfills the target's minimum structural requirements. But we can do better than casting, which is really more for when we're trying to override what the compiler can actually infer, by first looking at literal types. Take a variable that holds a color for a traffic light, for example. If we store it as a string, it could hold anything and the compiler wouldn't warn us. The problem with storing it as a string is we're no longer benefiting from static testing and we have to write extensive runtime tests for our values. What if instead we took a structural approach? If a string type is a shape that can hold any string, what if we defined the shape instead as the exact string red? What strings would be valid then? The only valid string that can be put in the shape red is the value red. It might seem silly to have a type that only allows one value, but what if like ampersand for intersection, you could also OR contracts together like this. Now the compiler allows any value that fits red or orange or green, but not blue. Our code again becomes simpler because there's less to maintain, because we don't need to keep checking the types, leaning instead on static testing provided by TypeScript. So static testing and structural typing give quite a bit of power, and these union OR structures can be more complex too. In this example, our HTTP request can be either get or post, and both have different structures, so we OR them together into a union type. 
Now the compiler will warn us if we try to use a field that may not exist, but will correctly allow it if we first check the type. This conditioning is called a type guard, performing type narrowing. If a type guard will never be true, TypeScript will flag this as an error and protect against typos. Lastly, TypeScript will also narrow the final condition to a special never type, so you can assert it like so. Asserting this never state becomes useful when you add another case to the union type and saves you tracking down errors at runtime. This is called exhaustivity checking and is a really important tool in static testing. You can also create your own type guards. More information is on the link. Another thing you can use literal for is for simple domain types or type branding. Domain types are values that are validated during construction so that the validation logic is not duplicated all throughout your code. There's more information and a tool on the link. TypeScript comes with a number of built-in types called utility types. One you should be familiar with is the partial type, which mirrors the structure of T and makes all the fields therein optional. Really handy for cases like this. Other utility types you should try out are record, which is basically a dictionary, read-only, which provides an immutable T, pick, which copies part of the T type, and omit, which is the inverse of pick. These utility types are all mapped types, so let's look at how those are constructed next. For these, we take three powerful aspects of types and use them together. Indexes, generics, and key literals. Combining these three aspects, we can create a type that uses indexes constrained to keys and generic type and the fields of those optional keys. And in this way, we've reconstructed the partial utility type that we looked at earlier. The last aspect of this section on advanced TypeScript types is on conditional types. These leverage structural types even more fully. Let's really dig into map types to make a type that represents this JSON serialized form of a value. We'll use the person type as an example. The deserialized version of Jenny is as follows. But the thing about JSON serialization is that dates are serialized as strings, and we don't know if nested values contain dates also. So let's make another mapped type that will represent the JSON for any given type param. First, we start off by mapping the fields directly to their current types, like so. Now we'll leverage a type ternary on each field and swap it to string if it's a date. JSON of is now a conditional type. But how do we deal with nested values like address? For these, we can use recursion. And lastly, what about if we wanted to pass in an array as t, like this? In this case, we can likewise check if the field extends array and then use the special infer keyword to get the array of what generic type. Conditional types are complex, but powerful. When would we use them? In most cases, you won't need to, but in cases like the JSON of type, they help you propagate and leverage static testing where otherwise a simple any or record wouldn't allow. That said, static testing provided by TypeScript is only present at compile time and no package exists in isolation. So tools like MyZod, Quartet, Marshall, etc. allow you to represent these types at runtime for validating inputs, URLs, user input, API responses, etc. Now we've covered a lot. Is there anything else? How do we take this to the next level? One thing you should consider as you move forward in your TypeScript is observables. Take this function. It loads all the people from a response into an array before returning the array. That's actually kind of slow, right? Because you could be doing things with the data while you're downloading it. So instead, we can add a special star to the function keyword. This allows us to use the yield keyword within that function, now called a generator function. Consuming code can act on the data while it's still streaming down. The return type of this generator is called an iterable iterator, this is an area of design called observables and is a powerful, scalable, and robust pattern for back-end and front-end development. For more information on this, you should check out RxJS, which is a library around observables. More information on the link. String interpolation, called template strings in ECMA script, was introduced in ES6 and so is supported in TypeScript. It also supports custom template functions, registering them when using the template strings array type as the first parameter. These functions are called without the brackets in normal JavaScript and are passed the template parts and interpolated parameters as arguments. And many CSS and JS libs build on this feature, such as styled components or emotion.js. 
This example shows how a generator can be used to automatically uppercase the parameters for a template string. And lastly, as of TypeScript 4.1, these templates now apply to generic literal types too. Here, the generic parameter is constrained to either top, bottom, left, or right, and the literal interpolates this to give a union type. We can apply these interpolated literals to map types too. Here, we assert to the compiler that each key that is a string is represented in this format in the result and returns the same type as the corresponding mapped field. There's a live demo of this in the link. Another example asserts to the compiler that each key is a string represented as an overload on the results on method with the same callback type as the corresponding mapped field. There's a live demo of this here too. And the community is already adding many more variants such as auto extracting a type from a declared route or auto evaluating the type of lenses. TypeScript also adds some type safety for ES6 decorators, which can wrap classes, methods, properties, and accessors. Decorators can add handy metadata to your class. Here's how you would use that trace decorator to log the input or output of a method. And the code for the decorator is here. The reason I wanted to bring up decorators is that using this metadata, TypeScript has several libraries now that provide IOC support via decorators. T-Syringe is currently the simplest, and an example is on the right. Other libraries include TypeScript IOC, Inversify, and TypeDI. TSX is an extension of TypeScript and allows us to write XML within our TypeScript, and is usually used to declare components for React and similar frameworks. There's more to this than can be covered here, so I'll cover this in a separate talk. In the meantime, a well-paced introductory course to React and TSX is linked here. CSS modules, SAS and SCSS, have attempted to bring logical constructs and imperative language into CSS. CSS and JS reverses this paradigm, instead allowing CSS developers to use the full power of JS or TypeScript, including static testing, type safety, composition, async, lazy, debugging, and more. Emotion and styled components are popular, but atomic approaches like Chakra are also starting to emerge. Many build tools like Parcel.js, Microbundle, etc. offer built-in zero-config support for TypeScript and TSX format. RushStack is a monorepo utility like Learner from Microsoft Research focusing on TS, and PMPM also ships with TS support built in now. ESBuild and SWC are other examples of modern build tools that ship with built-in TypeScript support. Beyond even these, Rome, from the creator of Babel, is designed to be the spiritual successor to Babel and itself is written in TypeScript, coming with native TSX support. Similarly, Dino, from the creator of Node.js, is designed as a replacement for Node.js and likewise comes with primary TSX support. And that's it. We've covered a huge range of aspects of TypeScript. If you want to dig deeper, there's a great course on many aspects of TypeScript at the link here. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to connect and chat on LinkedIn, Twitter, or YouTube. Thanks so much for watching.